Uh, so now we're back, and um, we're very fortunate to have John Sullinger again, who's going to tell us about elasticity, the compatibility of liquid crystals and lipid membranes. Over to you. Well, thank you so much, Simon. Okay, so this talk is a, um, a follow-up to what I did last week, okay? So last week, most of you were there, but not all. So I'm going to give kind of a, a quick review of what I did for uh, same frame uh, elasticity theory, the way I've reformulated that kind of a theory um, uh, for liquid crystals. And then after that, I want to show how an analogous procedure works for uh, lipid membranes to make a kind of reformulation of the Helfrich free energy there and to talk about what the consequences are for shapes of lipid membranes. Okay. Um, after that, it's kind of a choose your own adventure thing. I, um, I have a few topics related to elasticity and compatibility uh, in, in liquid crystals. And depending on how the time goes, I'll cover some subset of those things. And I can hide this thing on the bottom. Sorry, I was set up to be projecting from the Zoom and then I'm doing it a different way. So let me hide that thing on the bottom. A little better. All right, all right. So um, a little bit of a reminder from last week, or there may be a quiz on this. Um, a little, a little bit of a reminder from last week, right? So the the idea there is, right? We have a liquid crystal which has a director field that is some um, way that the molecules, the distribution of molecules, is oriented at any point in space. Okay. And we represent that by a unit vector in hat, right? Which varies as a function of position, right? So over here, the molecules are pointing this way. Over here, the molecules are pointing that way, right? It's gradually varying as you go around. Okay. Now, the variations of the orientation cost free energy. How much free energy? Well, it depends on how many you know, degrees per centimeter of variation you have, for sure. But it also depends on what kind of variation, that there could be a different free energy cost for variations that are going like this versus variations that are going like this, right? That there's no symmetry that relates those different types of variation. Okay. So we need to make a list of all the different types of variations and have an, a different elastic constant for each type. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are the types of variations? Okay, This is the thing that I'm doing a little bit differently from the classical liquid crystal approach. And the way that I'm doing it is based on this mathematical construction uh, which was uh, done by uh, Gareth Alexander here uh, uh, just a few years ago. So this could have been ancient history. This could have been 1966, right? But it was in fact 2016. Um, and uh, so this is a construction that uh, breaks up the tensor. I'm going to do this with a laser pointer. <laughs> Uh, that breaks up this tensor of uh, first derivatives of the director field, right? So this is all the possible first derivatives of the director field. It's a three by three tensor, right? That shows how uh, an X and Y and N Z vary as functions of X, Y, and Z, okay? And um, it, uh, so this is a tensor. You might think it has uh, nine degrees of freedom, but because n is a unit vector, that makes three constraints, so it gets knocked down to six degrees of freedom. Okay, and then this uh, clever construction uh, breaks those degrees up, uh, those degrees of freedom up into four types. Okay, what are the four types? Uh, one type is bend, that is uh, defined as the n cross the curl of n. Okay, and so that is variations that could be either like this or like that. Okay, so it's one type with two components. The second type is twist. 
or, or what liquid crystal researchers sometimes call double twist. It's a variation that looks like this, this way, and it's the same going all the way around, okay? So the director in the middle is tipping over as you go outwards, right? Uh, that is a pseudoscalar, so it has one degree of freedom, okay? Um, there is a, a, a third type, which is splay, or I guess you could call it double splay, which is the director in the middle is like this, and then outwards it goes like that, and it's the same going all the way around. Okay? Again, uh, a scalar, so one component. And then there's one more mode, which hasn't gotten much publicity in the history of liquid crystals, but is surely there. Um, and this is something which um, Gareth and his student, Tom Michon, called the delta uh, mode, okay? It is a, uh, a symmetric traceless tensor in the plane perpendicular to the local director. So it looks like it's going outwards this way and inwards this way, okay? That's one component of this variation. And the second component is rotated by 45 degrees. So it goes outward that way, inwards this way. Okay. Um, so that's what's uh, sketched in these uh, images there. Okay. Uh, whoops, wrong computer. <laughs> so um, um, Gareth and Tom did this for the purposes of, uh, of uh, topology, but it actually has important implications also for elasticity theory in the sense that uh, you can take this conventional expression for the elastic free energy of a liquid crystal and rewrite it, okay? So conventionally, it's written as something times splay squared plus something times twist squared plus something times bend squared. And then there's this weird divergence term, okay? And the divergence term has historically been called saddle splay. Um, and historically, people have used the divergence theorem to uh, integrate it to the surface, and they call it surface elasticity, which is sort of a weird idea. And um, what I think is a more natural way of thinking about it is to um, use that construction to uh, convert this combination into a half splay squared plus a half twist squared minus the trace of delta squared. Right? And then the whole free energy turns into something times splay squared plus something times twist squared plus something times bend squared plus something times delta squared. So it's the sum of squares of things, which is, of course, what an elastic energy ought to look like. Okay, so um, that's what I presented last week. Okay, so now the main thing that I want to present today has to do with lipid membranes, okay? So this is a way of rewriting the elasticity of liquid crystals, okay, in terms of four bulk modes. But there can be a similar kind of procedure with the elasticity of lipid membranes, which is historically described by the Helfrich free energy. That is something that has a quadratic term involving the mean curvature and a linear term involving the Gaussian curvature. Okay. The idea that I want to present here is to say that the, the same way that in liquid crystals, the thing that costs free energy is this tensor of director gradients. Okay. Likewise, for lipid membranes, the thing that costs free energy is the curvature tensor of the membrane. Okay. Um, if the membrane is approximately flat, so that uh, Z is some height as a function of X and Y, then the curvature tensor uh, looks like this, okay, in terms of second derivatives of the height function, okay? But what I'm gonna say does not depend on that assumption, okay? It works for a general curvature tensor. So you can notice that this is a symmetric two by two, right? So it has three degrees of freedom, right? Because this uh, x, y, and the y, x terms have to be equal to each other. Okay, so suppose we want to decompose it in the same way 
that had previously for the director gradient tensor. Okay. It's a little bit simpler because it's only three degrees of freedom. Okay. So if we want to break it up into different kinds of variation, okay, one kind of variation is the trace of this tensor. Okay. So that is uh, the, the second derivative with respect to X plus the second derivative with respect to Y. In other words, the Laplacian of the height function. Okay. That's analogous to the splay that I showed you for the director field. Um, and it's the same thing that people call the mean curvature in the context of whip and membranes. Okay. So that is, is one piece, right? It's one type of variation which um, transforms into itself under rotations. It's a scalar, okay? And so uh, that for sure is one um, separate mode of, of curvature, okay? Then we can say what's left of this tensor, okay? What is left? is a symmetric traceless two by two tensor, which is analogous to the delta mode that I showed you for liquid crystals, okay? So this is like splay, there's nothing like bend, there's nothing like twist, and then this is like delta. <laughs> okay. So this has um, two degrees of freedom, okay? And so one is, uh, you could say this component, the uh, xx minus yy, and another is this uh, xy or yx component. Okay. And so the xx minus yy, that represents something that's curving upwards this way, downwards this way. Okay. The xy represents something that's curving upwards on this diagonal, downwards on that diagonal. Okay. Um, so that's the delta mode, and like the delta mode for uh, pneumatic liquid crystal, uh, it, it has a uh, uh, two components, right? So the, the things I just illustrated with my hands, or you could rewrite those two components as a magnitude and a direction. Right, you could say uh, uh, how much is it going up in one direction, down in the orthogonal direction, and then um, what's the direction going around, right, where it's it's going upwards. Okay. Um, or alternatively, if you want to rewrite it in the principal coordinate system, that is the eigenframe of the curvature tensor. Okay, then we could say this um, splay-like part or the mean curvature part is the diagonal tensor and its uh, uh, components are the sums of the two principal curvatures, right? The one over the radii curvature. Um, and for the delta mode, the uh, uh, once you diagonalize it, its eigenvalues are plus and minus the difference of the two curvatures. Okay. So that makes a way of thinking about the curvature tensor, where um, instead of talking about the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature, you talk about the curvature sum and the curvature difference. Okay, so mathematically equivalent, but just a different way of thinking about the same thing. Okay, now, what's the implication of that for the free energy density? Okay, when you're working with the free energy density, well, um, I, I know from the liquid crystals, right, that I can have a free energy density that's this uh, K11 minus K24, one coefficient times the splay squared, and then K24 times the trace of delta squared. Um, for liquid crystals, there's also something with the twist squared and the bend squared, but there's nothing like that here. Okay, so I'll, I'll set this up and I'll put in that the splay squared is um, 
uh, this curvature sum squared and the delta squared, that's this curvature difference squared. Okay. Then I can cleverly demonstrate my mastery of high school algebra and um, rearrange this thing, right? And uh, it turns into uh, the <coughs> one constant times the curvature sum squared, and then another constant times the product of curvatures, which is to say the Gaussian curvature. Okay, so this is mathematically equivalent to the standard form of the Helfrich free energy that people have been studying for many years, okay? Um, and um, I'll point out that this Gaussian curvature term is analogous to the saddle splay term in liquid crystals, right? And both of them have some kind of divergence theorem or something like that, right? So for, for liquid crystals, the saddle splay could integrate to the surface, but I don't want to. I mean, I could if I wanted to, but I don't want to. I want to see how to interpret it without making it go to the surface. And likewise, the integral of the Gaussian curvature over a membrane is, um, well, there's theorems about that, right? And that it's at some topological invariant related to the edge of the surface if it has an edge or the genus of the surface if it's closed. Um, but maybe for the moment, I don't want to invoke those theorems. And let's see what we get if we just think about this sort of bulk expression that is involving the curvature sum squared and the curvature difference squared. Okay. But of course, it's just a different way of thinking about the same thing. It's mathematically equivalent to what's been done before. Okay, so why do I care about this? Okay, um, the main reason why I care is that I want to think about what happens if the membrane has some extra order, okay? So that it's not just um, a, a, a fluid membrane, you know, with no other order besides the local normal, but what if it has some extra internal order? What kind of internal order? Well, I, I'm thinking of two kinds, right? One is a parallel polar order, that is polarity aligned with the normal vector. So that's what comes if there's an asymmetry between, say, the two leaflets, the two sides of a bilayer membrane, okay? So if there are more molecules pointing up than down, for example, okay? That's one kind of extra order. And the second kind of extra order would be this octopolar order. That is, what if you have molecules that are going out like this and coming in like that, right? And they tend to align what their direction is in the in the bigger plane. Rob? Yeah, I just want to clarify, clarify for me. So now you're thinking again, molecules in three space, so the octopoles are three-dimensional. Oh yeah, everything I'm doing is in three dimensions, yeah. I understood, you could talk about quadrupoles and octopoles on the surface, I just want to make sure that you were uh, yes. Yes. I am thinking about three dimensional octopore order. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's do this parallel polar case first. Okay. So this is uh, a situation um, like in my little cartoon. Okay. So here, uh, imagine we have pear shaped molecules and there's a population difference so that more pairs are pointing up than down or vice versa. Okay, in that situation, okay, the free energy would have the, the same old terms that I was talking about, but then there can be one more term, which is the splay vector dotted into a vector representing the polar order, a vector that represents what's the um, sign and uh, uh, the magnitude and direction of this extra polar order, right? Uh, so something uh, perpendicular to the layer plane, 
Okay, so in terms of the curvatures, okay, that is the two terms that I talked about already. And then one more term, which is uh, linear in the splay, which means linear in the mean curvature. And that gets multiplied by the magnitude of the polarity, right? Which means the magnitude of the population difference between molecules pointing up and molecules pointing down, okay? This is, in fact, something that is well known in biophysics, right? This is part of the original Helfrich free energy, and it's called the spontaneous curvature, okay? So spontaneous curvature, um, it's, it's represented in this kind of notation, okay? And it, so it's something that tends to favor some curvature of the membrane. And we, when we write it in this way, we can see that what it favors is uh, a sum of the curvatures, right? That if you think of varying separately the curvature sum and the curvature difference, then the optimal state, at least locally, has a non-zero curvature sum and a zero curvature difference. Okay. So zero curvature difference means a sphere, right? That's, that's the kind of a shape that has uh, equal radii of curvature. And then um, the specific value for the curvature sum means a specific value for the radius of a sphere. Okay, Rob. Well, one more thing that's maybe on the next slide is, remember the high school algebra you did? Uh -huh. Usually that's rearranged by completing the square to get another well, the a squared term and that term are rearranged so mm -hmm. you get a difference of varying age in your target mm -hmm. spontaneous curvature. I, I don't know if you do that here. You can uh, rearrange it. The C not yet, I think, gives you that that spontaneous. Uh, yeah, yes, and and so the yes, the optimal value, right? So this is something I was maybe doing in my head and not writing out explicitly. But um, thank you. That's a good point to emphasize, right? That the way you find what's the optimal value of h would be uh, completing the square in, in h that you could do there. Right. Or alternatively, in my preferred notation, the optimal value of the curvature sum would come from completing the square of this and that to get a specific value of the curvature sum. OK, you may or may not notice that the optimal curvature sum that you get from that procedure here is different from the optimal H that you get from this procedure here, uh, which has to do with what constraints you have on the Gaussian curvature or on the curvature uh, difference. I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Um, right. So, so if you imagine that the curvature sum and the curvature yeah. difference are two independent variables, which maybe they aren't, but if you imagine that they are, um, then you can complete the square for this and this to get the best possible curvature sum. And you can, this is already a square, it doesn't need to get completed, right? And the, op, the best possible curvature difference is zero, okay? So this means sphere, and this means what's the radius of the sphere. Right, okay. So, um, you know, you could get a, a sphere with a certain radius, maybe you could get a multi-lamellar structure because a certain range of radii might be okay. Um, but, you know, that, that would be the optimum. Okay. Now, some fluid membranes can achieve this optimum, right? Some fluid membranes can flow so that they can make a curved structure with any Gaussian curvature, and then they can form a sphere. No problem. Okay. On the other hand, some membranes might have a certain elasticity, right? If they have some internal solid-like order, 
then maybe they can't bend to form a sphere, okay? In that situation, well, maybe they'll settle for a cylinder, okay? Because a cylinder um, has a, uh, a, a curvature sum that's not zero, right? And so if what you want is a curvature sum, a cylinder will get you a curvature sum and you have to sacrifice by having a curvature difference that you don't want, but maybe it's okay. Okay, so this could be a mechanism to make a cylinder as like a second choice to a sphere um, if the Gaussian curvature is, is uh, too energetically costly. Please. What happens if you have a membrane which encloses a certain given volume and whose radius, if it were spherical, is not such that it's compatible with the angular mismatch given by the dipoles? Are there some instabilities of curvature? Is there undulation on the surface that comes down to optimize energy? Um, I, I, I haven't thought through that, but um, I will say, you know, this formalism is mathematically equivalent to what has been done for decades, right? So anything that has been derived for that problem, um, I'm backward compatible with that, right? And, and, and so, um, uh, yes, the same um, energetic balance between internal curvature energy and extra constraints uh, still absolutely applies. Uh, I mean, this is the discussion also. Sure, please. Um, so the problem you described with uh, volume and area and energy was first considered by Peter Kahn. <laughs> Uh, medical doctors understood the shape of dead blood cells. That's pre 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 health thirty five months, thirty four years, and what you have is a phase that's a little bit like we've seen in embryology, gastrolytic. So, for example, if the volume to close is really really small, what it tends to do is be like a double layered sphere with a little neck in between. That's that's sort of the extreme of the case. But in some rare unique cases, you get things that resemble. If recites red blood cells in the sphere. The volume is large? Um, well, if the volume is large, it depends on if you're measuring the sphere, sort of contains the biggest possible volume. I mean, um, is uh, this uh, conical shape or whatever of the dipoles mm -hmm. would suggest an optimal sphere size where it mm -hmm. all matches, and then you might imagine what happens to a much larger sphere where you would be optimum to have local curvature, which is as suggested by the dipoles, mm -hmm. but then you still have to conserve the volume. And there must be some compromise between the two. There's there's always competing considerations yeah. like that, right? And and so um, yes, that is a further level of complexity, which I haven't studied here. It's just okay, but it's certainly out in the, the literature, the biophysical literature, which is a very big literature. Okay. What I want to show you is something different, okay? What I want to show you now is what about this case of octopole order, okay? Because that's something that has, I think, been missing from the biophysical literature, which I want to add. The idea of that octopole order is, you know, what if you have molecules with a shape like these distorted tetrahedra, right? So out this way, in that way. Um, and or, or maybe it's some complicated chemical structure, but there's at least some component of that kind of a shape, right? Um, in that case, there is a, um, uh, they, they might align like this, okay? And that alignment, that's an octopolar order, um, and that would couple to the delta mode of deformation which means that it would couple to the curvature difference. So then we would have a free energy that looks like this, okay? There's something times the curvature sum squared. There's something times the curvature difference squared. And then there's something that's linear in the curvature difference. So the optimal state then would have zero curvature sum, that you can see from looking at this square, and it would have non-zero curvature difference, 
that you could see by completing the square of this term and that term. Okay. So you, uh, this is this is not in the Hilfig free energy, right? This is a, a different kind of term, which also favors a non-zero curvature. Okay. And um, why is it not in the Helfrich free energy? Well, because the Helfrich free energy is meant to describe membranes that are isotropic in the 2D plane. And this mechanism is not isotropic in the 2D plane. This mechanism has uh, a favored uh, orientation in the 2D plane. This is what I was asking. So you call that an octopole. And if I were looking from the perspective of the, sur of the surface itself, uh -huh. I would call it a quadrant pole, but I'm keeping track of plus or minus signs. Yeah. It's the kind of common was you can include those by including little handles to the surface. Right? But I can talk about it later, but it's, 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 you think a topological. Uh, okay. I, I'd be interested in learning more about it. Um, it's it's a little bit tricky to think about because it's not just a favored direction, say this way on the top. It's also a favored direction perpendicular on the bottom, right? and and so that that matters. So in some sense, when you think about the the surface, you have to think about which side is up, right? And and so um, I'm sure there's a good mathematical formalism for that. Maybe you could show me what it is. Okay, but in three dimensions, you have to think about it as an octopole. Okay. Um, so the optimum state then has a curvature sum, which is zero, and a curvature difference, which is a specific non-zero number. Okay, so this is a description of a minimal surface, right? A minimal surface means something where the curvature sum is zero, i.e. the mean curvature is zero, and the curvature difference is non-zero, right? So that could make a shape, which is a saddle, at least locally, and there are various ways that a satellite shape might get extended over longer distances. For example, it might make a twisted ribbon like this, right, which has a local satellite curvature, at least near the middle of this. And it gets less good as you go out, but at least near the middle. It's like that. So some membranes um, can do this, right? If it's a fluid membrane, so the material can flow and rearrange, then it can make Gaussian curvature, no problem. And you would expect to see a structure like that, right? On the other hand, if the membrane has solid-like elasticity, then it can't distort to make a shape like that. So what's it going to do, right? Well, one possibility is it can make a cylinder. Right, because a cylinder has a non-zero curvature difference, which the material wants, um, it has to make a sacrifice, right? It doesn't want to have a non-zero curvature sum, but maybe it'll settle for having a non-zero curvature sum in order to achieve the curvature difference that it likes. Okay. Um, and so um, I'm suggesting that that makes a way of thinking about what stabilizes structures like this or cylindrical structures in biophysics. Because indeed, there are a lot of structures like this in biophysics, and there are also helical cylinders in biophysics. And this is a, a, a mechanism for generating and stabilizing things like that, okay? Sometimes people use a language like, uh, oh, the membrane wants to have Gaussian curvature, right? But that's that's a weird thing to say when you're looking at the health of free energy because it's not like there's a specific value of the Gaussian curvature that's favored there. There's just a linear term in Gaussian curvature. Um, I, I find it more interesting now to think about what's the optimal value of the curvature sum and what's the optimal value of the curvature difference. Now, this actually 
makes an interesting connection with something that Philip told me about uh, last week, right? So um, Philip, I guess this is back as part of his PhD, um, worked on um, simulations of hair-like particles in three dimensions, okay? And um, based on the argument that I presented to you, um, you know, my first guess would be, oh, the pair-like particles, they're going to do some kind of symmetry breaking transition where more are pointing up than down, and that makes favorable spheres. That's not what happened in his simulations. Instead, what his simulations found was that they could make a, a gyroid, that is a minimal surface, okay? So uh, the pairs could arrange themselves locally like this, and it made a structure which I'm, well, this is a figure from one of his articles that I copied here. And so uh, the, the half the pairs have their fat ends in the purple region, and the other half have their fat ends in the yellow region. And then there's an interface in between, which is a minimal surface, which is what I would expect from this favorable delta mode, okay? So it's not exactly the way that I would have guessed, um, but this is a, a, a common phenomenon, you know, in the range of different kinds of soft materials, uh, including lipids like this, including block copolymers like that, okay? And so my, my speculation for what might be going on there is that maybe the pairs are forming some kind of effective um, particles, larger scale particles, with a structure like this one, which is the structure that would favor the delta mode. So that's kind of, uh, well, I don't have evidence for that. That's just total speculation on my part. Uh, but it's one way of kind of fitting this set of simulation results into the sort of story that I'm presenting to you guys today. Um, I really quickly can comment. It, I think it's exactly what, what's going on because you get this interdigitation of these air shaped particles mm -hmm. such that effectively um, the tips of the, of the pairs uh, can be considered as part of one channel, which is exactly widening in one direction and in, and then in the other channel in the other direction. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's exactly what we're talking about. Hmm. A question for both of you. I'm trying to wait. Um, the gyroid locally, in the sense of the patches of it, are all isometric to 200 to the liter and you know, the whole the triangle circuit. They all share the same Gauss map, the same normal map, but the second fundamental, the, the trace free second fundamental form, part of which is the second level form, is the one that's too big, you know, delta is rotating. Uh, it's the that way. Did you did you try this for different I mean, part of, Is that supposed to be a picture of how the particles are arranged in the, the gyroid? Yeah, that's a, also you, yes. So this is a little bit. So for the diamond for the diamond phase, you have a further distance between the um, skeletal net, like the skeletal bed weight and the minimal surface, which means you have to add more material. So if you add small spheres, you can get into the diamond. Okay, so, so basically what you're doing is you're changing that rotation angle of your trace free, the, what's left in the second level form by doing something to the particles. Yes, if you, if it's, it's effectively um, adding more materials such that they can um, add that space and then you get this exactly mm -hmm. the as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I mean, this exists in, Real liquids plus water systems, as as done here, uh, there should be a small angle X-ray signature of that kind of short range order. Is there any experimental evidence? Well, these pear shaped particles, I no, no, not yet. Yeah, I guess another comment on the file here. Uh, <laughs> so the third example, I'll talk about those plus just tomorrow. The black part. Yeah, mm -hmm. and maybe sort of complicate the. 
narrative interpretation here, right? So, so those are molecules which are pretty structureless. If anything, they're polar in their uh, structure. Mm -hmm. They're pretty elliptic. -like. As they organize in these for this particular phase, or the P or the P, they you can look at the shape of the molecule. We've done this, and it indeed becomes in these phases bipolar, right? The question, of course, is whether is it the molecule choosing that structure, right? Um, because the, there are other structures, of course, that they choose uh, that are the property of the molecule and that. And the property of space, state filling, which uh, allows that. I, you and I, I guess, discussion. yeah, yeah. So, I guess it's in some sense, it's a question of cause and effect, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so, um, what's the cause and what's the effect? And likewise, you know, in, in general, I would say, um, you know, if you, if you look at a, say, a free energy expression like this, um, and so then I could add on something maybe proportional to octopolar order squared, right? And if it's a material that doesn't want to make octopolar order, right? And then the question is, um, it, it, is the quadratic form positive definite, right? So you, you have a quadratic form, which is you know, the energy cost of delta, the energy cost of the octopolar order, which I haven't written here, and then there's a favorable coupling between the octopolar order and the delta. Okay. And um, those things together make a quadratic form in octopolar order and delta, right? And that quadratic form might or might not be positive definite, right? And so you could have an instability where at high temperatures, it's positive definite, which means that there's going to be no octopolar order and no delta. And then as you lower the temperature, there might be a symmetry breaking phase transition. Okay. And that phase transition could be driven, but maybe by reducing the energy penalty for octopolar order, or maybe by increasing the coupling, right? Or by changing the elastic constants, right? And any of those changes could could cause the transition from no octopolar order, no curvature, to yes, octopolar order, yes, curvature. I guess the only the statement I was making is that anytime you have negative gas curvature, you must have octopolar order. Yes. This, which I think we agree. Yes, yes. In, in, yes. I promise less than 10 seconds. Sorry, no. The question wasn't cause or effect. In fact, what I was hinting at and I would be proposing it could be done is control or not, we can control that. The, you know, the mathematician says, oh, I've got the associated family parameter, I choose the angle, sine theta goes to theta. Mm -hmm. If you can control that molecular like structure, if I ask you the question about what goes into it, then you have to put it back to it. I think we can see you know, that's voice of the family, you have to put it back on the Physical. That's not control. Okay. All right. So that that wraps up the first part of what I wanted to uh, show to you guys today. All right. And the conclusion that I have from that is that um, maybe Gaussian curvature is overrated. Right. Can I say that in a math conference? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 that. Mm -hmm. That that um, I, I want to think of everything extrinsically, and that um, I, I I think you can think about the curvature sum and the curvature difference, right? If you're thinking about extrinsic stuff, right? Or maybe to be nicer to Gauss, I should say um, Gaussian curvature is an appropriate way to think if you have, say, a membrane made of molecules that want to be surrounded by seven other molecules. Right. And so that's an intrinsic reason to curve. Right. If, if you want to have seven neighbors, then maybe the whole surface should curve some way so that it can accommodate seven neighbors. Right. Or if you want to have five neighbors, then it could curve in a different way. And you could accommodate that. Right. But if it's not that, if you're thinking about hacking of objects shaped like that, 
right? Or packing of object shaped like that, then I would say it's less useful to think about the intrinsic Gaussian curvature and more useful to think about the sum or difference of principal curvatures. All right. So that is like the first quarter of my talk here. Um, all right. Oh, please, please, yes. Can I ask a question on that? So of course. You're saying Gauss curvature is not uh, extrinsic, but because Gauss curvature does translate to something extrinsic, because really you can think about mean curvature and Gauss curvature as the uh, two parts of the polynomial that tell you how your surface area changes when you go to a parallel surface. Right? Yes. And so equally, it tells you how much volume is there in between the parallel surface pitch and the original surface pitch is a function of pi. Yes. So can you and can you relate your theories that you put up where you're basically favoring order uh, to the alternative theories, which are sort of uh, relating the molecular shape to the shape of the uh, sorry to the size of those parallel surface. Mm -hmm. volume elements. Um, well, uh, I mean, that's uh, a great suggestion. I don't think I can answer it right right here. Um, but it's, yeah, to phrase the question differently, so this, yeah, when you're saying you want to require molecules to favor up to, up to polar order, mm -hmm. is there really just to say the molecules have a certain shape such that when they fill the 3D shape, which is a liquid membrane, uh, these uh, volume constraints of the molecules are fulfilled. Can I try to use the next for a second? The curve, the Gauss curvature term is the net curvature term for the Taylor expansion. So if you've got a very thin thing, it's, it's negligible compared to the trace free part. I guess it's a curvature. the curvature. So that, that could be a way around that he could escape the question. <laughs> it's the second, it's the T squared term, the distance squared yeah. term. I, I think maybe um, I, the best I can say for right now is that, um, I mean, what I am presenting here does not conflict in any way with previous theories, right? It's it's a way of rearranging terms. So it's it's not as if either could be right or wrong. It's a question of storytelling, right? And what makes an interesting story, right? And I'm playing around with this version of the stories for here. Um, Maybe I can go on and present one other thing briefly in the 10 minutes or so that's that's left. Um, Philip, you're going to show something with curved space, right, later on today. Okay, let me show a curved space thing. That just has a few slides. Okay, so let's see if I can do this. Uh, I'm going to switch to a different PowerPoint file. But how? <laughs> Let me find a different PowerPoint file, which is this one. Um, all right, and I will load this up. Oh, no, wait, I have to share it first. Um, I have to share it. How am I going to share it? Um, let's go to Zoom. Ah, so complicated. Yeah, no, not that Zoom, different Zoom. Zoom and share. Wow, well, I'm going to reduce up my time doing the Zoom sharing. All right. I'm sharing that. And I'll go into slideshow mode or something. All right. Um, maybe that will work. All right. So uh, about curved space. You know, I guess years ago, people would bring coal to Newcastle, right? And now I'm going to bring non-Euclidean geometry to Aberystwyth um, uh, or, or to a math workshop, right? I may regret this. Um, one thing that I showed you with the liquid crystal problems, right, is that there can be many situations where um, a liquid crystal has some kind of internal order beyond regular pneumatic order, and that favors a certain director deformation. Okay, the director deformation might be twist, 
that's the most common situation, or it might be bend or splay or conceivably this delta mode. Okay, so with any of those scenarios, okay, we get an optimal local configuration which has non-zero of one of the modes and zero of all the other modes, okay? But there is no such director field like that in R3, in 3D Euclidean space. Um, that is to say, there's no director field that has that set of derivatives. Okay. This is analogous to problems in solid elasticity, if any of you are familiar with that, because in solid elasticity, um, you have uh, a, a displacement vector field everywhere, and then you have a string, which is derivatives of the displacement. Okay. You can't just make any old string tensor that you want, right? Because a random strain tensor might not be derivable from a displacement field, right? And so the strain tensor has to satisfy some compatibility conditions in order to be derivable from a displacement field, okay? So for liquid crystals, the director is analogous to the displacement field. And these modes, splay, twist, bend, delta, are analogous to the strain. Okay. And so there might be some optimal values of these modes, but they have to satisfy some compatibility conditions to be derivable from a director field. Okay. So we know that the optimum state might not be derivable from a director field in 3D Euclidean space. But what about non-Euclidean space? Maybe there are different considerations for non-Euclidean space, okay? This kind of research topic was um, actually uh, foreshadowed many years ago by uh, work by uh, Jim Sethna at Cornell, who was thinking about the case of twist, or he would have called it double twist. Okay, so he wanted to make a model for uh, a blue phase, okay, which has a favorable double twist, okay, and he understood that it was impossible to fill up three-dimensional Euclidean space with double twist everywhere, but he and his collaborators figured out that you could do that in S3, that is the three-dimensional generalization of a sphere, okay? And so that made, that could make a director field which has pure constant double twist everywhere and zero bend, zero splay. It also has zero delta, but they didn't know about it at the time. Okay. This is a picture of the optimal structure in S3 that's been projected into Euclidean space, and then the Euclidean picture is projected onto the screen, okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's not easy to read this thing, but some of you may be familiar with the Hopf vibration as a mathematical construction, and this is that, okay? So this is a, a structure where the director is everywhere tangent to the Hopf vibration in S3. And you can see that it has double twist everywhere. If you look at the director right in the middle along this axis, then it's, it's twisting over as you go outwards, okay? And that is true everywhere here. Okay, and in this projection onto the screen, it looks as if this is some special direction which is different from everywhere else here. But in the real S3, there's no difference. Every, every place is the same on, on the three-dimensional sphere. Okay, so um, this was done by uh, Sethna and his collaborators back in 1983. 
Okay. So when I started uh, working in this topic, um, you know, in, in I don't know, around 2015, 2017, something like that, um, I, um, I got curious about uh, what would happen if it wasn't favorable twist, but favorable splay or favorable bend or favorable delta mode, right? If twist fits perfectly in some non-Euclidean geometry, what about the other deformation modes? Maybe they would fit perfectly in some non-Euclidean geometry. So I started collaborating with these guys in uh, Paris, uh, uh, Rémy Mosseri and Jean-François Sadoc. Uh, maybe some of you know these guys. They've worked in geometric frustration, other aspects of geometric frustration for, for their whole careers, right? They've, they've spent their lives in curved space, right? And so they, they know how to deal with problems like this, okay? And so, we went to try to categorize that. And so we want to try to figure out what are the different kinds of curved space and what kinds of liquid crystal deformations can fit in these different kinds of curved space. Okay. So for example, they figured out that you could have a situation with constant splay. That's what's illustrated in this picture uh, in the hyperbolic space H3. That's like a generalization of a saddle to one dimension higher. Okay? And so H3 can be projected into Euclidean space with this construction called a Poincaré ball, uh, which is uh, illustrated here on the screen. And this makes a state where the director has a splay everywhere. You can see coming down from the North Pole, it looks like it's pointing down. And as you go out, it splays outwards, right? This picture makes it look as if the North Pole is a special direction different from everywhere else. But that's just an artifact of the projection. In real H3 curved space, all these points are the same. Okay. So um, there is a mathematical classification of the different kinds of curved space, right? All of the spaces that are homogeneous, that is the same at all positions. They're homogeneous, they're not necessarily isotropic. That is, they could be different in different directions, but they're the same at all positions. This is, I think, called the eight Thurston geometries. Am I saying that right? I think so. Okay. So up to these eight geometries, okay, one of them is R3. That's conventional flat space. Then there's a generalization of a sphere, S3. There's a generalization of a saddle, H3. Okay. There's S2 cross R. So that's a regular sphere, just extended uniformly in one more direction. There's the regular saddle H2, just extended uniformly in one more direction, H2 cross R. And then there are three weird spaces. Okay. The, the, the one three from the bottom, so people call me S, S, L, S, L2. S, yes, SL2, SL2R, maybe something like that, right? I'm okay. just throw the R back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll just show you off. Um, okay. So there, there are these. There's this, this is the list, right, of spaces. And we went down the list and then we tried out each of these kinds of director deformation. And we could find that each of these kinds of director deformation um, perfectly fits in the right kind of space. And there is a catalog like this, right? And so, um, um, these are all deformations that have some um, ideal configuration in the right kind of curved space, and then they are frustrated by having to live in three-dimensional Euclidean space. I should say that um, this, this is something we did, I don't know, five years ago. Um, in the time since then, 
Um, there has been further work on, on, on developing the compatibility conditions in any arbitrary non-Euclidean geometry. Some of that was by Gareth Alexander here with his uh, student Pollard, and um, also by uh, Effie Efradi at the uh, Weizmann Institute. Right? And so um, those guys have um, developed general expressions for the compatibility conditions in any arbitrary curved space. And um, so this is a, a, a list. So uh, applying their general conditions to this list of possible spaces uh, shows where each of these deformation modes can be achieved. Okay, I agree. Just to clarify, so this, so this is like I should refer this as pure single mode because certainly Correct. combination, certain combinations for R three. Yes, certain combinations can form in R three of uh, twist and like delta, or uh, bend twist and delta, right? And so this is showing where you can have a pure mode of constant magnitude right on on this list so the question for the, like the they're gonna address that question which is the helicotical structures for r3 that are what's known about these other cases about what mixed modes are possible um i i have not looked into that perhaps gareth has um, or at least Gareth's equations cover that whole range of possible on stage. Right. right. Um, so, so part of the job that we've done here is to make a, a, a list of what are all these possibilities. Okay. The part of the job that I think I don't know so well yet is what does it all mean? Right, and so um, now that we have this list of possibilities, um, can we use that to figure out something about the director deformations or how they get projected into three dimensions, right? Or alternatively, for someone who is kind of a beginner at non-Euclidean geometry, can this give us any insight into what those spaces might be? And so, um, this is what I am hoping uh, Philip will figure out for me, right? Because he's going to be talking about curved space coming up this afternoon. So, uh, a quick yes. I just like to insert that there's some brand, just in the last two years, just all of a sudden, some nice new visualizations, especially the weird things at the bottom of the list. That may help. I can show you something. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maybe I should wrap up here because I think I've, I've, I've used up my time. Uh, so I will uh, thank you all for your patience with this stuff. And um, let's uh, take a break. Maybe. Or Rob, do you have any questions? Well, I just, I, first, let's start. The, the eightfold way, so to speak, which not only got uh, Thurston, but you know, that, that idea is that philosophy, which is very Gilman talked about uh, the corn. So it's very unified. Well, he had eight. I don't know if it's the same eight. It's, related, it's only related to eight, but it is actually. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but, but not serious, serious comment. So, uh -huh. so, so the most serious comment is that, of course, nil is sort of a sad word, but it's Heisenberg geometry also. So, Take some credit for Heisenberg. Okay, second, um, here's the serious comment, and it's got to be fast. One is that um, the, the understanding of minimal surfaces in these geometries is obviously related to understanding you know, exactly this type of thing. You began your discussion by looking at sort of targets, splits. In this case, the splay is the new curvature. So there has been, for about 30 years, that I've done, but all this I've published, but other people have on understanding minimal surfaces in these geometries. And here's the interesting thing that I think would go back from that. There's a theory that was built mostly by Robert Bryant, what noted early on, earlier, Wayne Lawson. There's a sort of a 
cousin or sister construction of H between one geometry and to the other. In some ways, like Sadak Mosari is it's very specific on minimal surfaces and it focuses exactly on the delta. So it's by <laughs> the delta part, which is the trace free part, that stays the same. What happens you trade mean curvature for ambient curvature. And so the example is minimal surfaces in the three sphere F grade mm -hmm. are isometric to constant mean curvature, so bubbles in R3. And that kind of correspondence is a cousin or sister correspondence works all the way up and down. Well, Saul is really different. That's just a really weird one. It's a little bit different than the others. The other ones, the other ones all the, the, the top seven of this have have a little more structure than, than Saul does. And it could have a sort of preferred direction for general. We did an R3 and S3 if you treat it the way so preferred direction. And what happens is that you can make a correspondence between pairs of these. R3 is also a weird concept. So I think that's what I'd like to talk with you about that. Or anyone else is interested in it. It's something I think is, is more subtle, but it focuses on the delta, on the, on the, on the trace free set. That's what that's, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a very key thing. It's also it's the Hopkins differential for those two. But it's a very key object on you know, constant mean and minimal sources. And the whole work that satisfies the cushion of my equations, but satisfies an equation of the surfaces, constant mean curvature zero. I am so glad to have your travel guide to uh, Saul and Nil. It's almost as exciting as a trip to Wales. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot longer to get there. <laughs> I'd love to show you at least one yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And it is so weird that this delta mode has has not been a part of the literature on these subjects because it certainly you know deserves to fit into that, that story. And so um, it plays a big role in mathematics, a constant literature, normal surface. It's a big, it's a it's the, that's why Heinz saw the development. It's what proves, for example, theorems about the meanness of so called. But that was the first time that my mother used that to show that the round sphere is the other thing. Thank you. Let's um, enjoy it again, break the coffee, and come back there. <laughs>